Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Michael for inviting me down to speak. So as some of you all know, I'm actually from the games industry and it's really a privilege to be talking to people from the junior dev community because the games industry, I always feel like it's kind of in a silo and uh, we have our own little space, our own little weird, like awkward, you know, networking parties and stuff. But I think it's really cool to have like some cross pollination. So today I'll be here to share a bit more about the games industry and hopefully um, like attract some people in the games industry or either like you know like get rid of some like misconceptions or whatever so um a little bit about myself i'm gwen my day job is that i run a startup called imba interactive and actually my background is not uh, development or programming i started out as an audio engineer so our company deals with game audio, which is super duper niche. It's like we do music composition, sound effects, voiceovers, and um, implementation for games specifically. Games and apps, any form of interactive media. Lah. So a lot of our clients spend from VR to like AR to like you know mobile games, PC games, um, console games, etc. <laughs> so actually, I want to talk a little bit about audio implementation because I think not a lot of people know about it. Um, in in games. Audio implementation is the behavior of sound in games. So for us, we do the assets. So for example, let's say um, I record Foley, I record footsteps, and I record like maybe eight footsteps for each surface. Let's say on wood, and then some on grass, some on water. So audio implementation means that writing an algorithm or using an audio middleware to randomize between eight footsteps uh, as you trigger the footsteps, right? Now, of course, you can have the difference between run and walk. And when you collide with the floor of a different surface, the eight footsteps change to another array of eight footsteps of a different surface. So that's like a very basic idea of what audio implementation is, which is the behavior of sound in games. So that's um, <clears throat> something I really, really stand for. Um, that's my day job. And uh, a little bit more about me. I have two cats. Um, and since most of you are gamers, the new MBTI like, you know, the Mayor's Briggs thing, you know, INFP and all that, but no, we want to talk about my role in, in like, when I play MMOs and stuff. So, for Paladins, right, I play Maldamba, which is a weird healer that throws snakes at people. Uh, for Lord of the Rings Online, I play Law Master, so I like to play, like, crowd control, you know, roles and stuff. And then, of course, for Overwatch, my main is Moira, who's this weird healer that throws pee at people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, I like to play City Skylines, um, a lot of other resource management, city building games. And right now, I'm playing this indie game called What Remains of Edith Finch. So that's a little bit about my personal life. Um, aside from that, I run a non-profit uh, association called Singapore Games Guild. So for Singapore Games Guild, we aim to rally and build the ecosystem of game developers in Singapore. A little bit about what we do is that last year we launched a database of um, every single games company in Singapore. So ranging from like MNCs to Indies to um, solo developers. So if you want to have a look at um, our companies in Singapore, you can go to sgg.org.sg and take a look. Another thing which is quite ambitious but we've managed to build up most of it is to put the database of every single made in Singapore game. So everything from like games made in 2004 to present day and those work in progress, they're all catalogued here. And all these are fully community run. And if you want, there is a view for you to look at analytics and um, all the statistics of games. Uh. So like let's say in Singapore, you want to know um, which is the most popular game type, then you will realize that, oh, maybe if you sort it out by chart, it is actually premium games rather than free to play, for example. And uh, for us, we hold events as well. So this one was our industry day. We held it at NUS Enterprise, the, the one that's a bit far out, la. Not, not the one here. <laughs> yeah, so this one was held at NUS and, um, and we use this event to attract fresh grads into the games industry. So especially those that are graduates from like game courses, etc. then they will come here and then we have speakers who are veterans and then they'll come and share their experience. And then we also run smaller events like roundtables, which um, the last one Michael helped us out with, which is to record a roundtable for game design topics. So the, the most recent one was about VR, and the previous one on this side is uh, playtesting. Other things that we hope to achieve is like a jobs board or fireside chats and newsletters. So without 
further ado, this is like the rough contents of what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, wait. Okay, so these are like the game studios that are here locally, though there are many, many more, but these are the ones that can fit into this slide. So <laughs> there's a mix of triple uh, A, which are more commonly known as the MNCs, those big studios, and a lot of them are like branches of uh, studios that are global and worldwide, like Ubisoft, you know, Bandai Namco, um, Tecmo, and uh, Gumi, IGG. So um, these are the ones that are maybe like 100 plus employees in Singapore, you know, they form the bulk of like a lot of the employees here. And then you have the SME studios and the indie studios. Um, well, the only difference that defines an indie and SME is how long they've survived. Like, but like, over here, like the SMEs, we have like Mighty Bear, which have investor backing. And then there's a few more investor backing, like they like studios, 12 Braves. And uh, of course, those that have been generating revenue through their games and being sustainable. Uh, and of course, there's indie that are doing, they are maybe quite young, like maybe one to three years old, or like doing smaller games. I mean, how many of you know what indie games are? Indie games. Yeah, cool. So indie games are like small bite-sized games, you know, some of them, they are not completely made for generating revenue, even though like it's nice to have, but some of them have like, an artistic vision that they want to show or a story that they want to tell that may not necessarily like, for mainstream the way like Assassin's Creed is. And of course, there's the solo devs. So solo devs, they are either like crazy enough to do it full time for years or they are hobbyist developers as well. <clears throat> so maybe I'll run down a list of what kind of games that Singapore game developers have done. And of course, first and foremost, there's Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So Ubisoft in Singapore uh, helps out with a lot of the Assassin's Creed franchise. And of course, the upcoming Skull and Bones is entirely made in Singapore. So that one is not out yet, but keep your eyes peeled for it. Um, Sarianto VR. So this is one of the more famous VR games that come out from Singapore. And then we have Ace Combat 7 which is made by the Bandai Nanko people here and Holy Potatoes, a weapon shop in the studio a bit more, a few more like Masquerada, Songs and Shadows Cat Quest, how many of you heard of Cat, Cat Quest? Yeah, so that one is like really really proudly made in Singapore I would say one of our more successful uh, indie hits here um, Yeah, so but aside from development right the reason why actually for Singapore Games Guild, we want to focus more on creators rather than developers is that because there's so much more to games creation than just coding, right? There's a lot of other um, facets of games out there that form this whole ecosystem. So you want to talk about games development, right? What about tabletop and card games? What about arcade games? Serious games? Does anyone know what serious games are? Cool. <laughs> so for those that don't know, right, serious games are games for utility. So, uh, for example, if you're working on a VR game for um, surgeon, surgery students, so it's a simulation of like, oh, you know, you have this human body in front of you, how do you explore this human body and you do this like surgery, like you cut up this person's heart or whatever, what happens next, etc. So it's meant to prepare um, the students for the real world. And then, I think one of our very first serious game projects was quite interesting. It was, um, it was a simulation on what happens when there's a flash flood in a building downtown. So, <laughs> yeah, it was really, really niche. It was like uh, in a bank building because this developer, they package this serious game and then they sell it to banks. So what they do is that, um, yeah, they had this whole flash flood sequence and like what do you do, what are the steps that you take, what are the precautions that you take, how do you evacuate. So, yeah, that's a serious game for you. And of course, art and experimental games. <clears throat> There's quite a few of uh, them in Singapore, although they're not very well known, but it's still nonetheless an important part of the ecosystem. And of course, there's AR, VR, MR. There's the Asia VR Association that deals with the AR side. Games as a service. So a lot of corporates, they would approach uh, people that develop games to gamatize their product or like perhaps make it more interesting. And then there are service providers like myself. So like I do game audio. There are people that do porting services or there are people that do art outsource. And there are events people, there's games journalists, games publishers, game schools, incubators that support game studios like Pixel Studios and investors and VCs. So, <clears throat> 
these are the basic tenets of uh, uh, games development here. The ones that are conventionally taught in a lot of schools. Uh. So, um, programming, art and design. When you want to study for games, a lot of people conventionally choose these routes. So, schools like DigiPen would offer these uh, routes or like... Uh, <laughs> or like uh, polys, etc. But I think when people join these um, courses, there are actually much more career options than we think. So for example, let's take art. And I'm quite happy to see like non-coders in the crowd as well. So like I met like two artists and then like it goes to show that how diverse the games creation crowd is. Lah. So Art, you need not just be a concept artist, you know, you can be a UI, UX artist, you can be a modeler, you know, you can go as niche as lighting or rigging. And of course, between programming and art, there are overlap. So for example, technical artists, the generation of particles and special effects, that kind of thing. Or like, let's say you're playing a game and like, um, there's rain or like you want to do a tool about uh, tree generation, you know, rocks generation, landscape, terrain. All this is under technical art. Then visual effects, you know, and of course there's like gameplay programmer, which is quite standard for um, games industry. Lead programmer, and then there's all these like um, other ones like server programmer, AI programmer, systems designer, um, and tools, tools programmers. So bigger companies like let's say uh, Ubisoft, for example, they are looking to test their game. But in order to test their game, they need to make a AI or a tool that can like keep testing and testing and testing instead of hiring human testers. So that's one example of the tools that people can um, make. La. Of course, when you want to talk about design, there's like few different kinds of design. So UX, UI design, character design. And of course, like if you look at the chart, you can see like a bit of the cross pollination of skills right there based on the where the words are located. And uh, narrative design, and for those that are doing free to play, there's monetization design, the art of trying to get people to spend money for free to play games. <laughs> so they they understand the mechanics of addiction, you know, they understand what makes people want to spend more money for their game. So it is very important. Yeah, and of course, just now I mentioned there's a lot more roles in the ecosystem. So writing, composing, project management branding and comms, marketing, legal, all these are still very, very important parts of the game's ecosystem. So, like, I think because games industry is, unlike a lot of other industries, is, is very, very passion-based. I think people always have, like, this assumption that games, oh, you know, like, cannot earn money, and then, like, I cannot tell my parents, like, that I work in games, they won't treat me seriously and all that. But just now I heard someone mention that Games now is like a multi-billion dollar industry. It has surpassed music, it has surpassed film and TV. So actually, next time you just show your parents that piece of news <laughs> before you join the industry. Yeah, so I mean, I, it, I was surprised to hear that it's still a stigma. I know I was just talking to my friend today and like, it's 2019 and despite it being a billion dollar industry, people are still having this prejudice against it. But actually you shouldn't because it is, not just lucrative, but it's also really, really fun. I mean, for many of us that play games, right, I'm sure some of us dream to make our own game. So, they are not, like, success and failure are not destinations. Uh. It's all about gaining knowledge. So, um, this is by Ninja Theory. Do you all know uh, Senua Sacrifice, this game, Hell Hellblade? Yeah, it's a really, really good game. So, you want to dream of making the game that you want to play. Yeah. So in terms of hiring, right? Uh, how many of you are actually interested in joining, like considering the games industry? Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, since there are artists and designers in this crowd, and these slides were catered for developers, so I will roughly go through lah. Um. I would say the main difference between AAA and Indie or MNC versus SME is specialization versus generalist. And by that, I don't, by this, I don't necessarily mean, oh, you know everything and you're equally skilled in everything. So by generalist, we are looking at like a T, 
like a inverted T shaped specialization where like you specialize at least one thing and you know roughly a bit of everything else. So that sort of thing is very, very well sought after in indie game studios because indie studios don't have a lot of people. Maybe you only have like five people running an indie game studio. So some of you might need to wear several hats. Myself, I started out as a composer and then sound designer. And then right now, because I'm a founder, so I learn a bit of project management, business development. And right now, I specialize in um, audio implementation itself. So due to circumstance, I, I learn new things. Uh, and in the end, I found talents in all these different things, which I never thought possible. Like, I never thought that I could code. But after learning implementation, I realized that actually can be done. Uh. You just need a goal right there. And then instead of learning the, the way of learning languages, which is you learn all the syntax properly first, is the other way around is that I want to get from point A to point B. And then I try to like see how to get there like, using code and all that. So for us, we are blessed with tools like Unity and Unreal Engine. How many of you have heard of that? Unity and Unreal Engine. Yeah, so these are great tools. Um, I mean, thankfully, you don't have to code everything from scratch because uh, let me just show you an example. Right, I have Unity right here. So Unity, right, is like a sort of like 3D, 3D viewport thingy where like you can spawn like cubes and stuff. 3D object cubes, you can even do 2D stuff. So like, and then you can like physically place them on the stage, like with your coordinates right here. So you don't have to manage put in stuff. Yeah, so actually like, Tools like Unity, you don't really need extensive coding knowledge to begin making a game. You can start with simple scripting. Yeah. So it's very cool. And then obviously for us, we go through the usual like uh, version. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, version control stuff. You know, I don't know. This is probably quite familiar to you guys. Um, and this is Mono Develop, which is the tool used to code in Unity. So they can either use like JS or C sharp for this. <coughs> yeah. So that's Unity. And uh, for Unreal Engine is actually for me as an audio, uh, audio implementer because they have this system called Blueprints, which is like graphical programming. So that one is really, really convenient for me. Yeah. But like, let's say you want to be a games designer, you minimally need to know a bit of basic scripting. And like you need to know like at least one game engine inside out. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to what I look out for. Not me lah, but what hirers look out for. I think let's say for triple A studios, in my experience, in my observation, um triple A studios and mature SME ones. So by mature I mean like they have investor backing or they've already reached a stage where like, oh my game is generating enough revenue, I can make my own game again the second time and not feel the pain. These people tend to look for um, people with two to five years experience or five years experience and above. But two to five is a really good uh, number. Yeah. Whereas I think for indie, fresh indie startups, they're happy with entry level coders. So yeah, it's good. Lah. But they have two different requirements. And uh, if you have two to five years experience, most likely you're being trained to be a lead programmer. And um, your language, your programming language of choice. So um, the big studios, if I'm not wrong, for example, Ubisoft is looking for people that are fluent in C++. But if you are programming tools, you only need basic C++, you, but you might need to know Python or C Sharp. Yeah. So that's just one example. Other MNCs might be different. Whereas Indie in Singapore, because Almost everyone is using Unity, so actually C Sharp is good enough. Yeah. But if of course if you want to diversify your portfolio, it is better to know a few languages uh, and then specialize in one like the inverted T that I mentioned. Um, your skill set, it definitely helps if you T even more and that you have experience in art or audio or design. Because this is very, very valuable for not just indie studios but triple A. It's not just about wearing hats, it's about learning how to effectively communicate with people from other departments. So, especially in MNCs, the departments can get quite, um, they're often like separated in a sense. So you need to spend extra effort to like communicate with them. Whereas for indie studios, there's only five people. So like you can just turn behind and say, hey, you know, can you like optimize this better? <laughs> yeah. 
And of course, curiosity and attitude lah. This one is um, understated but really, really important to always be curious to like improve yourself. And uh, I think especially for, well not especially lah, both lah. Both MNCs and uh, SMEs require that attitude to keep, um, keep on learning new things and improving yourself. So for example, even as an organization, um, most triple A studios, they are always looking for new tech. Like you can see triple A studios being interested in things like um, VR, even though they are not necessarily doing VR, but they're always considering possibilities. So <coughs> the indie ones, it'll be interesting to learn a bit more about biz dev. Like really, really believe in your product because you are working on this product and like in a way, because the company is so small, all of you need to be evangelists for your own product. So things like um, knowing who your target audience for the game is, you know, who you're making for, all these kind of things is very important when it comes to like your game design decisions. Oh, I didn't realize I was not presenting. Okay, you all can see my notes, which is nothing much. Yeah, so for interview tips, I think um, first and foremost, right, I think most people don't look at your CVs. Ah. In fact, they would rather like just look at your portfolio first because portfolio matters a lot. So for the games industry, especially if you're a fresh grad, right, it helps that if you have made like some small games of your own because it shows that you understand the requirements of making a game. So for example, like I met a lovely lady that like I know she's very embarrassed by her game. Like <laughs> she made this whack a mole thing. But of course she she may think that it's like nothing much, but actually like it counts a lot to have made your own game because you understand what it's like to integrate art into your game. You understand what it's like to make gameplay decisions or even like decisions that you make, oh what audio do I put in here? So actually it all helps with like pushing your, your inverted T shaped thing because because you understand the full cycle, then you won't be like this programmer that's in your silo. And anyway, in the games industry, it's all about teamwork. So bring your work and portfolio um, that it is a lot better if it shows games in it. So for example, like let's say audio, like I want to hire somebody from audio. I think showing me a video screen capture of your sound in the game is a lot better than just throwing me your sound links of your music and stuff because audio for example is all about behavior and if you just show me the quality of your sounds it's not enough so the same with art if you just draw like your art piece there it may not be enough but if you show your art in context in an entire game it may make more sense and of course research on the company I think this one don't need to say like, if you want to apply for Ubisoft please play Assassin's Creed <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, like if you're applying for a mobile games company, just make sure that you're a mobile gamer, you know? Or if you're applying for a console game company, just make sure you're a console gamer. And better still if you play the genres there. Um, do be prepped to take a practical test. I think most companies for programmers, they do prepare a test for you. Yeah. Uh, don't overdress. The games industry is super slack. Like, you know, don't wear suits and tie. <laughs> don't be late. Yes, and I, it's very fair to ask about pay and benefits and leave system. Like, I know it's a passion-driven industry, but it doesn't mean that you ought to be abused in this. It's a job like any other. So, um, in terms of networking, right, it's a whole bunch of um, conferences, both locally and around the region, that you can go and network. So, the ones in um, bordered up are the local chapters. So they aren't exactly events per se, but they are um, groups, uh, interest groups. There's SGG, and then there's IGDA, which is International Game Developers Association. They have a branch in Singapore. Sometimes they run um, beer meetups, etc. There's Unity Developers, Singapore Unity Developers. So sometimes they hold like um, Unity-specific talks. Singapore Indies, they whole like I think a bi-monthly meetup for indie developers to showcase their games and to play test the games and coffee shop game dev is an interesting one so they used to hold it like weekly but I think it's, it's waning but I think new blood like yourselves can help to keep it going coffee shop game dev every week they meet up at a place like Starbucks and they work on games that are not part of their day job so it's really good for hobbyists etc 
Then the rest on the right side are all the popular um, game conferences you can go to. So we used to have Casual Connect, which is like um, a global games conference, but they moved to Shenzhen recently. So it's no longer in Singapore. So the sad thing is we don't actually have a huge convention in Singapore anymore. Except Unite by Unity. Yeah, y'all should go for Unite. And the next nearest one is Level Up KL. That one is really good. The indie energy is, is super huge and like the developers there are great. There's a Taipei game show and another one which I didn't put down but it's a Busan Indie Connect. So Taipei game show obviously based in Taiwan. Busan Indie Connect obviously based in Korea. But these two are great because I think they're the only regional conferences that um, would sponsor you to showcase your game at a booth. Yeah, for free. They'll pay your, for your lodging and your booth. You just need to pay for airfare. Yeah. And of course, there's GameStart. And uh, GameStart is mostly a B2C conference, but there is a B2B element every year. So you should keep a lookout for it. Yes. So... <laughs> This one is a bit of, um, especially for um, new, those new to the industry, and I think this is applicable regardless of whether you're in the games industry or not, is that, like, I understand that if you're new to the industry, you might feel, like, a bit inadequate, like, oh, no, I don't know anything and all that, but actually the truth is that we don't know everything. All of us don't know everything. What you know... It's probably why I don't know. So, for example, I'm pretty sure that all of you in this room are better programmers than me, for example. So, yeah, you have a gift, you know, flaunt it. So, a great way to, like, really network is volunteer events, work on your elevator pitch. Like, not just pitching about your project, but pitching about what you do. Um, showcase your game. Don't be afraid to, like, show your game to other people or, like, your products. Be shameless in a way of promoting yourself, but be humble enough to listen to others. And of course, enjoy the community. And almost everyone will be as awkward as you, like me. So, yes, this is essentially what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. So, aside from the fact that I like pie, um, <laughs> well, I want to say that the pie is not finite. I know it seems like, let's say when it comes to jobs and all that, you know, like, um, even though a lot of people say, oh, you know, the games industry is so saturated, you know, there's only these few companies here. But it is not finite because there are jobs elsewhere, there are jobs being created everywhere. And actually, if all of us work together as a community, we can expand the pie. Lah. So don't think about, I'm competing for your job or like, oh, I'm poaching from this company. Think about adding to the whole ecosystem and think about you as an individual. Just because you get burnt out in your current job doesn't mean you cannot hop on to another company, to a better company that treats you better. Yeah. So I think uh, that's all for my talk. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Any questions about the games industry? Any questions for Gwen? She'll be around, so you can talk to her and uh, talk, uh, get her get her contact details if you need to chat with her a bit more. Yeah, if you all want, um, I can show you the link to my... Uh, let me see. Please join the Facebook page. Yeah. yeah. Join Singapore SG Games Guild. Join this Facebook page. So this is where we drop postings and... Um, all the games that are being made in Singapore. There's actually quite a lot. Yeah, I'm surprised myself as well. So, yep, cool. That's all. There's also a Women in Games group that was just created. So let me know if you want to join. Yes.